And last year I was talking, it could be anything from okay to terrible. Um, we got terrible, <laughs> which is really, really depressing if you're in my shoes. Um, it took about 40 years for us to get an update at all. And now with this update, I'm, I'm afraid that probably for most of the rest of my career, uh, we're not gonna have reliable records access. Um, the main point and the, and the main thing that I think everybody here should understand is that it used to be that you had a right to records technically in the law, but it was a right to a response from an agency in 10 calendar days. Uh, they changed that a little bit now that we have you know, better information storage, retrieval, dissemination. Uh, they decided that um, that process can take two months to forever. Um, now, the way they did that is they changed it from calendar days to business days. Uh, they said you get 10 in the law, but then Galvin, whose office, uh, the Secretary of the Commonwealth, who oversees the law in the regulations said that the first day that you turn it in, um, a records request it counts as received the day after the records access officer for whatever agency you're making a request to uh, is in receipt of it. So day one starts on day two. Um, so they have 10 business days to respond. Uh, on day 10, they can just send you a denial. And we'll say that for just the most basic thing, one page of open meeting notes for a public meeting. They can just say, no, um, you can appeal it. That takes 10 more days for the Secretary of the Commonwealth. And this is, again, business days. So on business day 21, you might get your appeal resolved. And you're right, it's public records, so they're ordered to give it to you. Uh, it's going to be 10 more business days at a minimum that they have to provide that because they're allowed to file for an extension within 10 business days. So on business day 31 technically now, your, um, your records response or the records themselves are due. But they can just file for an extension. Even if they won't get it, that's five more business days and then they'll be ordered to turn it over. So that's at least another business day. At a minimum you're talking 37 business days to get even the most basic record if they don't want you to have it. Um, 37 business days is two months. So uh, the public, the media, everyone, uh, we don't have access to public records for at a minimum two months. Uh, and, and this is without violating the law at all. But it's two months till forever. Because at the end of that process, there's nothing that stops them from just turning over a new set of exemptions that equally don't apply. And then you have to appeal again and you go through the cycle again, and that's another month every single time. So the old law on calendar day 11, I could say that the agency that did not provide the records uh, was acting criminally, and I could publish an article like, these criminals could face up to a year in prison because they are violating the statute. Unfortunately, our state AG, Healy, uh, won't enforce the law. And that's, that's a pretty good news story. I don't get to write that news story anymore. Um, because now it's perfectly legal to stall indefinitely. So uh, I guess part of what my address here today is, I'd really like to see the Pirate Party. You guys are open information activists, and that's part of why I love coming here. Um, I would like to see you guys adopt some of this language that it's a crisis. We have no transparency uh, and virtually no access to public records. And Anybody who decides to, to use that kind of language, I will support you. Um, I am an expert on it, and I will come and explain it to you in depth so that you can debate anybody you want on it. Um, so that said, uh, records requests are still valuable. Um, what you're trying to do, or at least what I'm trying to do, is force a measure of transparency in our government. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do that in Massachusetts. Uh, there's not one standard uh, form you fill out. And one of my favorite parts about the law is that you're guaranteed they have to take it if you show up in hand and hand it to them. Uh, that means that basically at the offices of any governmental institution, you can get in the door. If you're holding a records request and a camera, <laughs> you know, you get to go in and you can directly shame them. Like, here's a records request. It's for one page. It's for that right there, you know? Uh, is there a reason you're not just going to run that off? Oh, you're going to make me wait forever for it, <laughs> you know? And you can always go back. Um, and so 
you can sort of shame people into compliance, and, and I've had a lot of success doing that, uh, if you've ever seen some of the BSE videos. Um, that's, that's one of the tools. Now, what is a record in Massachusetts is actually really broad. It's any um, document uh, created or received by a public official in their public capacity. And the onus is on them to prove that it's not a public record. So you can request anything under the sun. Even if you wind up getting denied, they have to explain why they're denying you. And sometimes the explanations in and of themselves are valuable. You know, you can see, you know, if you if you ask for something and they tell you that it's a public safety thing, you know, you can see what kind of information they actually have. Um, so the new update, the other good news on it uh, is that uh, I call it the pizza principle. If you if they blow the uh, 10 business day response time and they don't respond, then you get your records for free. They can't charge you fees. Uh, I'm actually t testing that out right now. The city of Lawrence uh, blew, this is the first time I've had somebody blow the, uh, the deadline for it. And I just put in an appeal to say, nope, they need to make it for free. Um, that was about the, the minivans uh, full of stolen rims or something <laughs> that they, the mayor claimed when explaining why you can attack people who drive through the town. Um, so what I was thinking is uh, part of this was we were going to teach how to do a records request. Uh, and what I have up there is uh, basically my template that I use um, to do a request. So does anybody have um, a governmental agency or a particular record that they want a request done for? Because I'll just walk through how to do it. In Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Does Massport count? So that's so in Massachusetts, there are certain agencies like Massport that claim to be basically semi-public. Um, it's they should count, but uh, numerous times they've argued that they're technically private, even though they're mostly funded by public funds. So I'm happy to turn one in for Massport, and so, I'll so, be happy to appeal it and see what the official ruling is. So I mean, this is a, a silly request, but I'd like to know how much. Toilet paper passport buys in a year. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, we'll say paper towels. Okay. So all right, all right, yeah. <laughs> Let's pick 2014. So. What you do, or what I do, is um, obviously the new law that every agency is supposed to have a records access officer. Um, this is the person who you're addressing the request to. Um, then, I'll purchase order, yeah. Uh, as specific as possible. Um, sometimes I'd like to cast a wide net and then tell them which of the items I'm actually interested in if they, they're supposed to send back an itemized list of the things that might respond to it and what they would cost and any exemptions that they're citing. So this will be interesting, you know, because Massport might say we're a private agency or they might say, you know, paper towel usage would jeopardize our, our safety. <laughs> it's an ongoing investigation. We're looking into the use of paper towels, you know. You never know. And then at the bottom, I always date it. Now, I did. <laughs> yep, I did. Thank you. So, Massport's going to be interesting because I'll bet you they don't have an assigned records access officer. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would do normally is find the agency's website. Now, um, a, on the website, under the law, the new law, um, they have to list their records access officer with their contact information and hours of operation. So you'll know when to go in you know, and drop it off in hand, or you can just email it in. So if they don't have one, I like sending records uh, requests either, well, let's, let's see if they have a general email,
noise complaint. That could be fun. <laughs> Is Matsport a state agency? Well, all right, so I see what their argument's gonna be already. All right. When there's not an obvious, um, can I just go back to Matsport? When there's not an obvious uh, contact information, one of my favorite things to do is to send it to them through Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> this makes them really upset, but it also gives you a timestamp. It's, you know, the little seen it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and legally they have to take it. That's correct. Yeah. Any I've actually sent a Twitter request <laughs> to uh, the, what was it, Tuxbury police, because <laughs> they didn't have anybody listed, so. 140 character, like, little uh, records request. You can be the first to request via emoji. Uh, that would be fun. Um, okay, as long as we're gonna talk about silly records requests. Um, I once had my cat's Facebook page uh, get in lolcat speech um, do a records request to the Salem police. And so the Salem police actually had to write back to my cat and provide records. And that's it. So as easy as that, um, we've now put in a public records request as of tomorrow <laughs> when they get it, technically. Um, the clock starts and we'll see what they say. Um, at the end of it, anybody who wants the template that I use, uh, just um, I'll take an email list um, and I will send you that. And if you want, I can update you on the Port of Boston's um, upcoming denial. All right. <laughs> uh, actually, can I just uh, so there's the plugin to so. Uh, all right. So from bad to worse, uh, I'm just going to do a brief overview of uh, filing at the federal level. Um, and talk briefly. I'll talk briefly about sort of the general uh, process of filing a federal FOIA, um, and then go sort of give a, a end on a positive uh, example of how something filed even at the state level can have a positive impact at the federal one. And then from there, I think we'll just go into more sort of general. Q&A and comparing sort of the state of Massachusetts versus the state of the union, um, which is terrible on both accounts. Uh, so I work at a place called Muckrock. Uh, we are uh, founded in uh, 2010. We filed over 32,000 public records requests and led to the release of 1.3 million pages. Um, so working with us, it's, uh, we streamlined the process. We have all the contact information for everyone stored in our uh, back end. So pretty simple, Just go to muckrock.com and click file a request. Uh, that will generate the page slowly loading behind me. Um, I usually like to start with a good, exa uh, simple example. Uh, somebody name a dead celebrity. David Bowie. David Bowie, one of, one of the <laughs> popular choice, David Bowie. Uh, David Bowie, FBI, all files on David Bowie. Death was a matter of record. Uh, so what this does is it generates all the legal language necessary to file a request, um, which at the federal level is simply a sentence that says this is a request under the Freedom Information Act request, uh, the Information Act, I request the following records. A uh, very brief sentence explaining what you're interested in. Um, people will tell you that you should be very specific or make sure that you reference certain kind of things like, you know, cr back, you know cross references or certain files. Uh, in my experience, it matters a lot less than if you just simply file. The most important thing is if you have a question, you should ask it. Uh, we can get more into the specifics of that in the Q&A, but never stop yourself from asking a, uh, filing a request because you're worried you might do it wrong. Um, and then statement, uh, statement under here saying these requests will not be made for commercial purposes. Uh, 
So everyone here uh, is an all others requester, unless you're a member of media or research. If you have ever written for anything ever, then you're a member of media research. Uh, definitely tell them that, and that will get you in a preferred fee category, which means you don't have to pay for processing time, which can severely under, uh, cut down uh, how much filing these things can request. So definitely always mention that. Um, and that's about it. That's all you need to file a federal level request. Um, that being said, uh, the get ready to wait. Uh, the average processing time right now for federal level is 167 days. Uh, the legal allowed response time is 20 days. Uh, the uh, longest we've seen is uh, from the State Department, which can take usually around two to three years. They only have 50 part-time people who process any request at any given time. Um, and uh, I think even for the FBI, the very, very minimum request, uh, which means it's uh, processing less than, fewer than 50 pages, uh, is, takes around 50 days. So uh, no matter what, it's going to take a long while. Um, uh, so again, I feel like we've beaten you over the head with, with, with a bunch of bad news, so I'm going to end on a, a something of a positive note. Um, give a, an example of uh, the value of sort of public records. So we had a case where um, one of our users who was in um, Madison saw that uh, their local police were driving around in an MRAP, a mine-resistant re mine ambush-protected vehicle. I usually call it a tank because it's simply a giant heavy piece of metal with wood, uh, with wheels. Um, so Some he, of them made right here in Massachusetts. And, yes, <laughs> the Lenco Bearcat, yep. yeah. Um, so he requested from his local police, why do you have a, uh, a tank? And then they sent back that there had, the equipment had been sent from the Pentagon as part of this program called the 1033 program, which was shipping uh, excess mil military gear to local police. Uh, we thought this was really interesting, so we started, we filed a request from the, uh, the uh, Defense Logistics Agency, which is the agency responsible for uh, in, uh, processing all these transfers, and they said that they could tell us what the gear was, but they couldn't tell us where they were giving it, because that might put those communities in danger if you knew that they had a tank or not. You can process that for a second. <laughs> um, so what we did then was that we found, we, we did a little research, and we found out that uh, each, uh, uh, each one, the DLA was coordinating with a local level uh, uh, agency usually runs for the state police. So then we filed a request for every, the, for the transfer sent to every single agency. Um, and uh, with certain exemption, uh, exceptions, like say Mass State Police, which wanted to charge us $700 for that information, uh, or my own Louisiana, which wanted to charge $17,000 for that information, we were able to get uh, 35 out of the 50 states to release it. Um, and then after doing that, um, the federal government around the 35th was published, just gave up and started publishing it online on their portal. So now if you go to Defense Logistic Agency, they have a complete transfer list and where, the, where that equipment went. So now, um, now when someone want to just pick a, a police department? Boston. Don't say Boston. <laughs> Somerville. Somerville. All right. So. My favorite 1033 story is the grenade launchers oh. to uh, West Springfield. Well, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of school districts were getting grenade launchers and uh, turning them to beanbag bean launchers. Yep. Um. And then there's Rehoboth, who I think have like 12 officers, two Humvees, and an MRAP. So, <laughs> Somerville <laughs> police received 26 5.56 millimeter rifles through this program. So. It could be worse, I guess. <laughs> uh, but so the, the sort of the point of that is that, you know, it, this all started with one person who had a completely legitimate question about why their government had, was doing something or had access to something they possibly shouldn't, asked about it, and that started a chain reaction of events that led to the uh, Pentagon now having to publish the entirety of every single one of these transfers. So, you know, to, to Maya's earlier point, it is a very extremely frustrating and uh, often uh, slow and miserable process, but once any, any victory, I think, makes a huge change, not just here, but all, all across the country, so. Yeah, and while it might be almost voluntary for places to comply, a lot of the time, eventually, they will. Mm -hmm. um, 
one recent example for me was the there was a shooting. I want to say it was in Taunton. Um, the police shot um, somebody and killed him. This was during you know BLM, and it was inherently newsworthy. Um, a number of uh, different like local publications covered it. Uh, two days afterward, or actually in the original um, coverage of it, they said that the DA was looking at video of the shooting. So we knew video existed. Two days afterward, uh, I think it was the Boston Globe ran a story about how the family of the, the man who was shot by the police um, was disputing the police's account. And this was somebody who had, I think, um, immigrated to the US. So this was, again, inherently newsworthy. Uh, I put in a records request for the for the video because it exists. Um, they fought. I won an appeal to have it released. Um, the day that it was due to be released, instead of giving it to me, they posted it online, which is fine, you know. Um, so it became public, and actually, again, most of the major news agencies covered it when it came out. Um, I put in a records request for all the other records requests I got because the timing was so fishy. Turns out that I was the only person who had asked for this video. I mean, this is an inherently very newsworthy thing. And that could have been anyone. Anyone could put in for these things. So if there's something that interests you, I mean, you've seen how easy and how quickly you can put in a records request. Every now and then, you're going to hit something where you're the only person doing it uh, because it interests you. Uh, and sometimes that reverberates, and it's a, an important piece of information that you get. Um, so anyone, I, I mean, I, you don't have any greater access to records than I do. Um, any one of us can put in and, and start freeing up this kind of information. Yeah, I think uh, another great example is uh, Brandon Smith, uh, who was in Chicago, and he put in, I think it was the request for um, uh, the Laquan McDonald shooting, and he was the okay. only one who, who requested that, and it, again, they fought him, but he fought back because he had a right to that information. It led to the uh, to the video getting released and the, the officer's version of the story being completely discounted and Brandon wasn't even allowed in the press conference afterward because he wasn't a quote unquote real journalist even though he was the one who had released that information. Yep. It's anyone, anyone of you if you can ask for this information um, and as I think Maya's a great point, you have the same right that, any, that, that I do or anyone else. N never let anyone at the Globe or anywhere else tell you that. <laughs> um, Actually, what's really fun is to request agencies' interactions with the Globe oh. compared to, like, you know, with me. <laughs> They're like, oh, how can we get that to you? Oh, we'll cut the price for you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, I do that all the time. It's so frustrating. It's fun, though. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess um, it's sort of a, a good beginner spiel. Does anyone want to raise it to Q&A? That's actually uh, my question. The cost department, how, how are costs decided? Like, so it's at the it's at, it's at the federal level. Um, there's three fee categories. There's commercial, which is the uh, which you have to pay for both processing fee and oh, uh, search time and uh, the actual cost of recreating materials. Uh, so the dirty secret about FOIA is that uh, it's about 60, 70 percent, mostly commercial entities at the federal level. Um, patent trolls, ambulance chasing lawyers, etc. Like they basically. Mo file the most request. People, researchers and journalists make up a small percentage of it. I think as small as 15% in some estimations, um, which is funny because the only time people complain about records requests and how much money and time and resources they're spending is when journalists are doing it. But um, so that's the worst category, as it were, for fee request. Um, and then there's uh, the uh, all others, which means the first two hours of processing are free, and then after that you have to pay for processing fees. And then there's media, as I mentioned. If you, again, like the, the standards for getting media research are very, very low. If you've ever written for anything, you have any intention of publishing this information to, to increase public knowledge, uh, you have a chance of getting it. And everything but the actual cost of recreating materials uh, should be free. That being said, certain agencies like the FBI charge $15 per CD, like this is a Sam Goody in like 2004. And uh, so those costs can get super expensive for really no good reason. So a lot of that comes down to appeals and sort of pushback, but unfortunately, a lot of times you, you really just have to get a lawyer if the fee gets way too high. Um, I have a sort of quick anecdote about how dumb fees can get, but I'll let Maya no, talk no, about masters. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so Massachusetts, the fees actually did sort of get reined in hypothetically uh, under the new law. Um, it used to be that they could char charge up to 50 cents per page. Um, now it's five cents, so uh, that's, that's solid. Um, and what they can charge you for is redaction time. Uh, I believe under the new law they can charge you search time, which is something that other that agencies would um, charge before. Technically, they couldn't. Uh, There's lots of appeals. Um, in Cambridge, they would charge for like ten minutes. They would t they would take a lawyer's lawyer's rate and then yeah. like break that down to the minute. Yeah, yeah and they're supposed to use the uh, lowest paid um, staff person who can possibly do the work. Whether or not they actually do it, that's that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, quite often they'll argue, well, we need our lawyer to look at you know, mm -hmm. a basic public records request, so it's gonna be $200 an hour. Um, and they're the ones setting how many hours to bill you for, um, and it's an estimate. So they can just say, mm, it's gonna take you know half your lifetime. And, <laughs> and I, I actually had a district attorney's office that um, I was going to basically show the prosecutorial misconduct, and they didn't want me to show that for some reason. Um, and they decided that I needed to pay them twenty thousand dollars, and that they would have to do like a hand search of every file that they've ever made, um, and that it was going to take, I think, a year, maybe more. Um, so, at this point, you can. Uh, the new law says that at least for state level, um, they're restricted to $25 an hour. Uh, municipalities can apply for a waiver to charge you more per hour than that, and um, very small communities can just charge you more than $25 an hour. Um, one of the other huge problems, though, in the update is that it allows vendors. So my, my government agency can hire an outside company to just hold on to records and charge whatever they want because um, there's nothing in the law that really governs how vendors behave. Um, the actual cost of reproducing the records is vaguely supposed to be part of what the fee looks like um, and it depends on the agency. Some agencies will just proactively hand you almost whatever you ask. Um, one of the good parts of the update is that it mandates that, if possible, the agency is supposed to give you the um, fulfill the request in an electronic format. So, no longer are they printing out pages just to you know jack up the price and give you something that you can't you know use. Um, so there there were step for some steps forward in that. Uh, in Massachusetts, they'll send you a fee estimate if it's more than ten dollars. Um, so it's not like they're just going to ship you the records and then say, well, you owe us $20,000. So the pay for the time it takes them to write the estimate? No. no. All right. This, <laughs> so this, this is actually uh, one of the things that we sort of landed in the news for. Uh, we called it the, the Yo Dog. Um, they wanted to charge us a fee to figure out what the fee would be. Mm -hmm. um, and this was Mass State Police. We asked for a bunch of their IA files, which again, they decided for some reason they didn't want us to have. It was for the people who had the most complaints against them, uh, the troopers. This was a couple years ago. And they wanted to charge us $700 to tell us how much they were going to then charge us mm -hmm. for the records. Uh, what was that $700 value based on? So the lowest paid employees time calculating how much it costs. Right. And they are not allowed to assess that. Uh, okay. we, we did win an appeal on that. They never really gave us a, a, a real answer. Um, so, but they did win the Golden Padlock Award in, in part because of that uh, request. Uh, the Golden Padlock is awarded to the most secretive uh, governmental agency. So. And we, uh, we actually, a, a reporter actually filed for all the communications from Mass State Police about receiving the Golden Catalog, and it's just a bunch of emails saying, no comment, no comment, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Which but, is perfect. <laughs> yeah. uh, so just uh, two, uh, two, two quick things. Um, one, um, to, to Maya's point about vendors, at, sec at the federal level especially, that's the most troubling thing, is the move towards privatization at every level, and that's been a real danger to data access. Um, we do a lot of work particularly around private prisons, and private prisons are technically exempt from FOIA, so a lot of information that really should be public is just basically going into a private company and then just getting locked down. Um, and I can go to a couple more examples there later. Uh, and two, just real quick, the sort of example I was going to mention about sort of uh, 
ludicrous fees. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a quest was trying to get uh, just how many of a certain type of contract, a device that the Pentagon had, and so they filed for like how many of the hot plugged in do you have, which is a thing that basically just allows you to take a computer and, and like plug it back in while you're seizing it during an investigation. Um, and then they said that this, uh, because they didn't OCR their uh, contracts, this would take uh, 15 million labor hours and cost $660 million to, to produce. Um, which would then essentially shut down the entire federal government and therefore they couldn't do it. Um, be, because we had uh, filed also with a different office inside that same, uh, inside the Pentagon, that person called up the IT department and they were like, oh yeah, we have three. And that was all it took in 15 minutes. So a lot of the, so this is a sort of a great example of a lot of these fees don't exist for any meaningful reason, but just basically as a way to tell you to go away. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and you were at a question? Oh, yeah. There was a bill that came in at the New Hampshire State House, and I was assigned to lead the floor fight against this bill that wanted to charge minimum wage for, for records recovery for under right to know requests, except the municipality would choose or the state agency would choose the number of hours. They could just say, okay, well, that's a thousand hours yes. it's going to take us, a thousand man hours. And I thought that's, that's ridiculous. There's, there's, there's no limit to it. Mm -hmm. So we had a whole lineup of speakers, and unbeknownst to uh, the opposition, they showed up. And the, the whole freaking back of the room in the state house is covered with news cameras, up in the gallery, there's independent media, there's just media everywhere. And so uh, this kind of group of uh, mix of Democrats and Republicans to try to pull this stuff, they had a majority amongst themselves to get everything through that they wanted. But when the media showed up, they had to put two and two together, and sure enough, they just said, okay, we'll take one. So I had this brilliant, beautiful, eloquent floor speech to you know, <laughs> fight against this, this, this horrible, horrible, dark bill. And uh, they decided to table, so I lost my little mm -hmm. in the sun. <laughs> but it was good that we killed the bill, but they brought up a similar one next year. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of states are basically, that's the, they're either, um, an increasingly large number of states are adding essentially restrictions that limit only people inside that state to filing there. Um, and allowing to charge endless, you know, basically endless costs. Because the number of requests are going up, states are increasingly looking into increasingly dubious ways to just block all requests. But Massachusetts is ahead of the game. They That's already true. don't yeah. have it. Or early early <laughs> adopters of terrible. I, I terrible was going to say. Uh, yes. How do you know you're receiving 100% of what you asked for? And if there's ever a discrepancy, what happens to the uh, well, one, you should always appeal. Um, I think it was a third of all appeals uh, end up in the produce, producing more documents, which mean I don't, can't do the math, but that's like 20% of all requests aren't done correctly the first time, something like that. Um, two, uh, there's a community of requesters. You should all, uh, it, with with a giant with a caveat you can see from from space you know with all possible please share what you get with the community because it's important to know what people are getting we have a case just from this week where we were requesting records from Chicago about a certain uh, tech used to crack cell phones and they claim not to have it and then a member of the transparency community in Chicago reached out and said they gave me those records two years ago they spent two million dollars on it so routinely agencies are caught sort of in lies where they either will claim not to have or, or will release the wrong records. Um, and the final question is, what happens to the Nothing. 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 There's no, in, in Massachusetts especially, there's no consequences for, for not doing the law. Uh, in certain states like Florida or Oregon or even at the federal level, there are some consequences. In Oregon particularly, you can be charged for every day you're in violation of the law. But really without a strong legal uh, tooth to it. There's really no no one's going to get fired for not releasing the full information to some jerk who wants to make them look bad. Technically, in Massachusetts, violating the law is a criminal act uh, up to a year in prison. Um, now, it's never been enforced <laughs> ever, <laughs> and it's never going to be. Although, um, I haven't done it yet, and at some point, I would like to file the charges myself because in Massachusetts we can. Mm -hmm. And I think that'd be just the most interesting thing because some <laughs> poor bureaucrat's gonna have to come down and I'm also registered with the court so I can film in court. So all I'm picturing is I'm gonna have a video of this person being like, I didn't fill out a records, <laughs> you know? Wasn't it also like a $100 fine or something like that? Like a... Um, 500? 500? Plus 25 for every month. Mm -hmm. And then something else too. It's, it, it actually could be 
I think mostly it's just like the ultimate in the sort of shame tactic mm -hmm. of shaming them into it. It's like I will literally drag you down <laughs> in front of camera into court to fight criminal charges, <laughs> you know, or civil charges. Or but that, and that's to that point. A lot of people don't feel like they're they, they don't feel like it's a law. A lot of right. them feel like it's it's basically they're doing you a favor, and that's why I think that one thing you see from from dealing with a lot of offices is that they're like you can they're like why do you have to have an attitude i'm helping you out and you're like you legally are obligated to do this you know there's not many government services that people can feel smug about giving to you but uh public records is one of them yeah. any other questions so, so um in terms of you mentioned appeals a couple of times yes could you talk about how the appeal process works because i mean Usually, when I've made records requests, you know, you follow it up with the, you know, could you please respond <laughs> according, you know, as required by statute a couple of times. Um, but I've never, you know, done an appeal, and I'm just wondering what's the process and how much success um, has there been in FOIA appeals, particularly in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so, in Massachusetts, the, again, there's not like a standard. Um, form or something like that. Uh, what you do is you have to forward, actually just changed under the new law because you have to CC the RAO. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to forward the request, all correspondence, um, CC the RAO, and basically explain what the issue is to the uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth. Um, there's an email address. It's like PRE at um, the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, and what they'll do, actually we had to fight for this. Uh, they will immediately open the, the appeal. They were, bit, they were originally just like, we'll open it when we feel like it. Yeah. That, was, that was a big problem in the regulations written by Galvin's office. They're like, we'll take however long we want. But um, we fought that successfully. Uh, so um, then they have 10 business days to make a ruling on uh, basically your argument. and. What you're saying is, you know, either they didn't respond, which is a de facto um, denial, or they responded improperly by citing the wrong exemption, um, or not explaining their exemption, uh, or, or just it shouldn't be exempt. Um, and 10 business days from then, um, the Secretary of the Commonwealth's office is due to basically say either, yes, you're right, and they need to turn that over, or, uh, you know, they'll side with the agency. Um, in terms of how effective this is, <laughs> um, right, so I filed a whole lot of them. Um, there, was, there was a year that almost every single time I put in a records request, um, as soon as it hit day 11, I just sent in the appeal. I think it was me and Todd Wallach <laughs> neck and neck for like the number of appeals that year. Um, it depends on what you're appealing. The Secretary of the Commonwealth uh, has the Supervisor of Records, um, and we just got a new Supervisor of Records, so I can't really speak to her tendencies. But Sean Williams, the old Supervisor of Records, was in current Boston. RF. And yeah, I know. And who was ruling on the Boston <laughs> appeals while oh, like while going jockeying for a job? Or, yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah. He was awful. <laughs> just, just sort of amazingly bad. Uh, once ruled that a police report was um, not subject to the public records law and set the precedent basically that police can just withhold all their reports, all their logs. So we have almost no transparency in police because of this person and their crazy um, rulings. Um, rulings don't always make sense. They're not always the same. You could send in the same appeal about a different agency on the exact same exemption and get two different rulings. Um, uh, I found not a lot of rhyme or reason and the supervisor of records, that whole office that oversees it, um, has no ability to enforce their rulings. Um, they're supposed to turn over their rulings to the AGO for enforcement um, and then Healy doesn't enforce the law. So. Uh, and, and Healy's office then takes a look at it and comes to their own conclusion about it, which 
is nonsense. Well, yeah, we, we received communications between the, uh, the SPR and the, the AG, and the, the AG was basically like, oh, I disagree with every choice you made here, and so we're not going to do anything. And the <laughs> and SPR it's will not be like, her uh, job. <laughs> yeah, they're like, uh, I don't really think that's her job, and it's like, don't tell me what my job is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you know that they can also send it to the district attorneys, though? I did not know. Yeah. Um, technically, the supervisor of records could have then reached out to district attorneys to try to get it enforced through there, mm -hmm. but they've never done that because that would be proactive and useful. Yeah, so I get so the, short, the short, short version of especially in Massachusetts, uh, you can appeal, but you can win that appeal and still have absolutely nothing happen. Right. Heck, you can even pay for records and not get them. And not get them. We've, we've, and we're, we're still fighting over getting a refund over records we received uh, around like the, all the NSA communications yep. uh, with uh, BPD. Yep, yeah, that's crazy. Any other questions? Sometimes if you're persistent enough, you can get the refund. Um, we got overcharged by $2, and we thought it was really funny. So we just went to the mats to get our $2 back from the Framingham police. And it took like six months, but eventually they did. Um, no more questions? Right. Can I open it to like a, like a filing? Like a call out a suggestion or something? Anyone want to file anything? Yeah, I, I, I saw that. I, know that you, I think you've been doing some like, like, from our production, they seem much like standing ground files. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested if you could pull anything up about uh, Man and Cody Hall. Um, if they were, I don't know if they, you could like, request or they can go down. So is this person? So quickly, is this person alive? Yeah. So that's so if someone is alive, um, you and you can't get records on them unless you have their permission. So they have to fill out a permission form. But um, at the federal level, they have a special form. In some certain states, they don't even let you do that. Um, but Privacy Act pretty much covers that you can't get someone's you can't get files on an individual. You can get. Uh, files related to an individual's organization or certain like, things that happened to that person, like a police report, but all, files on an individual period for, fortunately can't be released. There is a privacy exemption in Massachusetts. It's not quite that stringent. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get a bit more information here, but they have to block out things like social security numbers, that kind of stuff, which they usually do. <laughs> Every now and then you still get them. But what, what sort of information are you interested in getting from this person? Uh, he, uh, he, I mean, he's, uh, he's a he has all my contacts there. He's one of the, he's part of the Shire University, the Shire University tribe. And he just, like, he had some really great stories about, like, his involvement, like, or, like, interactions with police. And I oh, just yeah. Like, I was curious to, like, validate more about them. Well, so one, to me about so, so one thing, actually, on that point, I'm glad you brought that up, and this goes to the idea of what are public records, is that um, records, in this case, don't just mean, um, uh, uh, um, like documents or PDFs, they also mean photos, they mean videos. So we've actually managed to get, um, um, so a bunch of photos actually taken from Standing Rock from both from, poli from police and also taken completely from stuff like uh, Unicorn Riot. Um, and there we saw, you know, sort of, you can see sort of the mass buildup of, uh, of uh, militarized police. Um, love, love, personally love that photo, I think that's great. Um, but we also were able to see, we got this panoramic photo here that um, actually revealed the fact they had actually deployed a sniper that was overseeing the, uh, the, the, the protest group. And, uh, we, all, we got a bunch of pictures that were take, looked like they were taken from a sniper scope, and we thought, okay, there's no way that that was attached to a gun. Um, but it was. <laughs> so I guess so that, to, to the, the point there is that you, know, you couldn't get records about this individual, but you could, if you knew where they were or what they were doing, you can get records around that, and that can help confirm some of the stories that you might have been hearing. Um, like we've, some of the crazier things we heard about, like the fact that they had one of those microwave trucks, uh, we were able to confirm that from getting pictures of, like, the, you know, the ones that basically just microwaves people to get them to, to like, stop. Uh, yeah, they had one of those, and unfortunately it broke down because it wasn't designed to work in cold conditions. <laughs> Go well. Mother Nature fights back. That's the I, I have one. Okay. Um, 1033 program, Nemlek. Ooh. Uh, so in Massachusetts, we have um, our SWAT teams are these regional tactical teams, and they are private. And I know Nemlek has, I believe, two um, of Bearcats or MRAPs, um, which is fascinating because they're a private organization. Um, so I don't know how 
And I put in some records requests about it, um, but I'm trying to ferret out how they wound up with um, Bearcat. So I guess, like, yeah, I'll just wrap up on that story real quick because I got the wrap-up si signal. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, Never mind. <laughs> but so uh, Nemlac is a great example. So Nemlac is a SWAT team It's uh, that was uh, basically covered in the northeastern region, and uh, I think it was ACLU originally asked for the records regarding their use of force policies and basic stuff, and they argued that they didn't have to release it because they were a nonprofit. Right. They were a nonprofit that is contracted to work with police and help them in tough situations. And it led to a $30,000 lawsuit that eventually led to them, rather than losing the lawsuit and creating a terrible precedent, they just automatically declared that they were a public agency and then released this information to the public. I think so they would have won. They would have. There's a pretty darn good chance that they could have won. That's um, the scary thing. So, so, so they, are, they are. They are absolutely a pro. No. No, they okay. they declare them have, they declare them that they they declare they should release the records to the public. They declare that the they public. are yeah. subject to the public records law. Right, but that However, necessarily they're a public agency. They are not a public agency. Um, if you look at sort of their structure, that's one of the things I'm working on. Yeah. Um, and it's not just that one SWAT team; it's all of our SWAT teams across the state, except for the state police one. I, I, I have that in the play. I wrote in the Arkansas City. She's very confused about that. She's like, I don't think it's true. I was like, no, that's that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>